Friedman was defining not just the political right, but also the political center. And right now, that cluster of ideas that he represented is, is being questioned both by the Democratic and the Republican Party, by the far left and the far right. He really feels simpatico with Reagan, who comes at a moment, both politically, he's bringing kind of fresh energy, the morning in America idea, and then a very coherent set of different economic ideas. Um, instead of spending money, we're gonna try to unleash the private sector. Let me introduce our star guest this evening, Jennifer Burns. Uh, Jennifer is an associate professor at Stanford, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, she's the author of 2009's Goddess of the Market, Ayn Rand and the American Right. And more recently, the end of 2023, Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative. And that's the book that we're going to be discussing this evening. Uh, I'll start with a slight spoiler, I suppose. I absolutely love the book. Uh, I think it, it, it's fantastic. And I shouldn't say this as someone who, part of my job is to publish nonfiction and I have to read an awful lot of nonfiction. It is rare that I encounter nonfiction that is a page turner and that I can't wait to pick up and read the next chapter. Uh, but your book is one of the rare ones that falls into that category. Thanks so much, Tom. Very kind. You're welcome. And that's, that's about as hard as these questions are going to get, by the way, guys. Uh, <laughs> but no, it, it, seriously, I re can't recommend it enough. It's a brilliant telling of Milton Friedman's life and times. It's also, it really works as, you, you use this term in the book, a partial biography of economics. Um, there are so many points in the narrative where, you, because you're explaining Milton Friedman's ideas and how they relate to the world he was operating in, um, you really inform the reader about different economic trends and different schools of economic thought. And it really is just a great introduction to all of that. So thank you for writing the book. Thank you for coming tonight. And I mean, I guess I'll kick off with the very obvious question, but what made you want to write a book about Milton Friedman? So um, thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Um, so my interest in Milton Friedman really came after I finished my first book on Ayn Rand. So um, that was an intellectual biography of the libertarian novelist and philosopher and trying to set her ideas within conservative politics in the United States, even though she herself didn't consider herself a conservative, she was very influential. And she was kind of a secret underground current. And so my job in that book was to show this sort of secret underground current, this figure that had been denounced by, you know, the leading lights of the conservative movement was nonetheless a really durable presence. And so stepping back from that, I still had questions about the kind of shift in ideas and politics over the course of the 20th century. And I knew I wanted to approach, I thought of Ayn Rand as a sort of bottom up model, you know, this um, thinker who was scorned and outside the establishment and nonetheless left an impact. And I was wondering what did it look like kind of from the top down, mm. um, more of an establishment story. And so for that, I turned my attention to the history of economics and pretty soon I just kind of bumped into Friedman. It wasn't really a plan. I realized this was a huge figure and I thought, well, let me read the book on Friedman to get on top of him. And I was like, there is no book. And then I was like, you know, thought bubble, uh-oh, <laughs> I could write that book. And so that's sort of how it began out of this longer set of questions and that first project. And the book was a decade in the making effectively. And so you started after the financial crisis. Did that play a role in, you were thinking financial crisis, uh, money, the Fed, Milton Friedman's a great topic all of a sudden. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I, I talk about this a little bit in the conclusion of the book. When I began writing, you know, Friedman seemed like the sort of ghost in the machine, the, the, uh, the villain in many people's story of what had happened in 2008, um, this sort of all powerful figure who had shaped our contemporary world. Then as I kept plugging along at the book, you know, I think I have this great timely topic. Um, the political currents really shifted and it se seemed that Friedman's ideas were being attacked from both the left and the right and, and people were kind of moving away from them. And you saw this most clearly after the election of 2016. Um, yet then you come fast forward to 2021 and the issue of inflation reemerges across, you know, the industrialized West as a real issue. So you get a kind of repeat of the 1970s when Friedman was in his heyday. So. I felt like by, by the time the book was ready in 2023, we'd gone through this full cycle of Friedman's importance, his diminishing importance, and then his return into the limelight, so. Yeah, good. And the inflation was good timing for the book. 
you know, I didn't plan it that way. I didn't want to write a 10 year book. I would have been happy to finish in five, but then um, people would have been like, what is this archaic book about inflation and this guy, Milton Friedman? So, you know, if the timing works out in the end, you can't plan these things. So here's the one tough question I have planned. I love the book, as I said, but I'm not sure about the title. Mm. And I know that other libertarians will probably have tried to have this argument with you as well. You address it in the introduction, but was Milton Friedman a conservative? And if so, is he really the last one? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Friedman didn't love the word conservative, and I've heard this pushback. Um, however, he did not ever sit down and write an essay called Why I'm Not a Conservative. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad for him, because if he had, I might have said, no, I can't do it. Yeah. But here's why I thought I could get away with calling him a conservative. Um, the first is because I'm looking at him for a lot of the book as an economist. And if you think of him in terms of the field of the history of economics, he takes a more conservative approach in the sense that he conserves older economic ideas from the quantity theory of money to um, Chicago price theory and really says these ideas, when the rest of the field of economics has left them behind, no, I'm gonna stay with these ideas. Also the methodology is very empirical approach to economics at a time when economics is becoming very mathematical and very mm -hmm. theoretical. So in some ways that is a, a Friedman, the, the conservative thinker, and I recognize he's also a very innovative and creative thinker, but one of the ways he's innovative and creative is by really sitting with older ideas and seeing what's left, how they can be rejuvenated or how they can be made to fit the modern era. And then the second one is almost purely semantic. Through the course of his political life, Friedman allied himself with politicians and publicists and publications and magazines that said, we are conservative, we are American conservatives. And that's different than the British context. It's a, it's a hybrid creed that blends in a lot of these free market ideas that Friedman represents. And so in that ideological context, you know, I could have called him a neoliberal. Well, that just gets you very mixed up in the United States because we use the word liberal in our own sort of idiosyncratic way. So I wanted to steer clear of that. And then the last, I mean, this is a bit of a provocation. I, I wish I could see into the future as well as I feel like I can see into the past. Um, but um, I think it's, it, we can talk some more about this. It, it goes back a little bit to that cycle that for a while Friedman was defining not just the political right, but also the political center. And right now that cluster of ideas that he represented is, is being questioned both by the Democratic and the Republican Party, by the far left and the far right. And so to the extent that he represents a sort of 20th century American conservatism, I think that that will that synthesis will not persist. And then it probably shouldn't have. It was forged in the Cold War. Something new will come. Um, and we don't know whether it will still call itself conservatism or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, actually, one of the things in the book, and it, it wasn't something you dwelled on in great detail, but I, I found it interesting. You know, I had always thought from the British context, well, American conservatism is different because uh, it, it feels more libertarian or classically liberal. And I thought, well, that's probably because what they're trying to conserve are the, the founding ideals of the Constitution and everything like that. Um, but the way you tell it, actually, in the post-war period, when Milton Friedman really sort of came, as, came of age as an economist, American conservatives or conservatism in America meant a lot, like what it means in Britain uh, mm -hmm. and in Europe as well. It was sort of socially conservative. It was traditionalist. It was about uh, pr protecting established interests and everything. And so I guess in that context, the, the creed that Milton Friedman really helped to develop and his brand of free market economics, he, he was forging a new conservatism in a way in the American context. Yes, and he was brought into many conservative spaces deliberately because they were kind of within the American context, besides all the um, economics and free market stuff, which we can unpack, two really significant aspects of his profile and his beliefs. Um, he was Jewish, and American conservatism had a long streak of anti-Semitism, and in the post-war era, for a man like William F. Buckley to say, my favorite intellectual is Milton Friedman, really signaled something different, that this is going to be or aspire to be a more meritocratic political movement that, that is open to all creeds. And then relatedly, that Friedman was a very globalist in his orientation. Mm -hmm. And again, that had been the, the sort of calling card of an earlier version of American conservatism was isolationism. We shouldn't get involved in World War II. Um, and maybe we explain 
Um, you know, we have an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory for the people who are saying we should. And so Freeman really is, becomes a symbol of, of Buckley and others wanting to kind of sweep that away, the old right. And so that's why they call themselves the new right or new conservatives. I think there's like new conservatism like every 10 years, yeah. but <laughs> there was the one moment. in the yeah. 50s. Um, <laughs> and so he really, uh, you know, that was, yeah, I think he understood that. And he, I talk about this very deliberately throughout his career. In the 1950s, he felt like he was fighting, we called the McCarthy McCormick wing of the Republican Party. And he met, you know, Joe McCarthy, the anti-communist crusader, and Robert McCormick, the conspiratorial publisher of the Chicago Tribune. And then in the 1960s, he sees himself fighting the John Birch Society. So he always has this idea that there's a kind of outer limit that he wants to help define mm -hmm. and kind of create a different type of center. All right. Let's jump back to the beginning. So yeah. in your book, we, mil we meet Milton Friedman basically in his teenage days. I think you introduced him with an article. He writes for his high school newspaper, encouraging people to go to college. And you follow him pretty much all the way through his life. Um, I'm curious from research. your research, what kind of impression did you get of him as a person, as a character, as a personality? And the reason I ask this is because I know there's probably one or two people in this room who've met Milton Friedman. I never had the opportunity, but I've, I've encountered many people who did, and they often speak of his, his warmth and his kindness and his generosity with his time. Um, and you don't contradict that, but there's also a lot in the book um, that probably points to a kind of intellectual arrogance, a certain sharpness in dealing with uh, his intellectual inferiors. Um, there's an episode in the book where he really kind of goes out of his way to undermine um, some of his colleagues at the University of Chicago and kind of kick out the econometric modelers. Um, what did you make of Milton Friedman as a man from your research? Yeah, so I mean, I think the first qualities anyone would notice, he's very extroverted. Mm -hmm. He loves connecting with other people, very intellectual and that kind of flight of ideas and verbosity and the love of argumentation really comes out. Now you go a little deeper, I think there is that dualism that you're talking about, because it's very clear that two things. One, he liked being the smartest guy in the room and he liked everyone in the room knowing he was the smartest guy in the room. The other thing I've heard though, is that he was also um, very, could be very generous and could really meet people where they were and lacked condescension. Mm. And so could treat, you know, the famous example as a taxi driver or a staff member or whomever, um, could have these long elaborate conversations with them and really engage with them. So I think it's mixed and maybe it depends on where he is in his life cycle, right. but um, he was kind of an academic street fighter. And part of that was because um, many economists as a field became more quantitative and especially as many of its leading lights were refugees from Europe they were not verbally, highly verbally skilled in the way that Milton Friedman was. So he had high verbal skills and high quantitative skills. And so he could just talk and argue rings around these other economists who would be like, yeah, I disagree with you, but like, I need to go back and write a paper to show why you're wrong. I can't like get the words out fast enough. So yeah. they were scared of him. I mean, they were definitely like, don't, um, don't ever go on TV with him. <laughs> you know, don't talk to him in front of other people, like steer clear. Fair enough. And I guess like every teenage extrovert, he initially wanted to be an actuary. <laughs> but, but thankfully for us, yeah, he, he was drawn to statistics and mathematics, yeah. but then economics caught yeah. his eye when he was an undergraduate. I mean, I think that just draws our attention to how limited his worldview was. He grew up a, as a child of immigrants from Eastern Europe. He grew up in a small town, New Jersey. He didn't have a vast you know, view of what the future could be. Um, and his father died when he was in high school and his father was sort of in the garment industry buying and selling um, an arbitrager. And so he just thought, oh, I'm good at math. I can work for an insurance company and I can calculate things for them. I mean, that was sort of as far as it got. Then he gets to Rutgers and the Great Depression hits and it just raises a whole host of other questions. Like, why are there so many poor people? Why are some people doing well? Some people aren't. What should we do about it? The political climate is very unstable. And it's there that he meets two professors who will really be important, Arthur Burns, who will be his lifelong um, friend, and then Homer Jones, who's pretty much fresh out of the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so Jones says, you got to go to Chicago. Here's where you can find the answer to these questions. You know, here's where you can have the big think. And so he's still, he's, I think, a dual major in math and economics. He's still winning math prizes. He still has that, that highly quantitative bent. But he decides, you know, I need to do more than numbers. I need to answer some of these questions about the society around me. And it seems like economics will open those doors. All right. And so he goes to Chicago for graduate school. 
really fascinating part of the book about the student days and the Room 7 gang. Yes. And, and some of these personalities have become big deals in economics later are kind of hanging out in the common room in a university. And it's funny to see how these intellectual movements grow from something that's kind of small and almost primarily social. Um, you mentioned the Great Depression already. Mm -hmm. Obviously, later in Milton Friedman's career, I mean, what really elevated him to the, the rank of the kind of world-beating economist was his, you know, uh, his explanation of the Great Depression in the monetary history. And I want to come back to that one. But for now, how did the Great Depression shape his thinking? And I guess a little later, World War II played a big part yeah. as well and maybe made Milton Friedman, uh, he's clearly in the tradition that goes back to, to Adam Smith and the classical economists. But his liberalism was a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's a couple things about that. Um, it's really, the timing turns out to be really important. So he gets to Chicago in 1932. It's really the worst part of the Great Depression. And there's a couple things he's gonna get from his teachers and from that environment. Um, the first is like, do something, do anything. I was surprised to find in my research, Chicago professors were very activist, calling for a very active federal government. They clearly saw this was an emergency. They clearly thought the government needed to spend for relief, needed to do what it could. And so Freeman picked up that ethos and that came wrapped in a real fear of inequality within capitalist societies. And if inequality became too pervasive um, in a situation like the Great Depression, it would just lead to the end of the capitalist system. So. Mm -hmm professors of his like Frank Knight and Henry Simons were really trying to rethink these principles of liberalism. So you get that that grounding of, okay, I have my first principles. I'm a believer in what we would call classical liberalism, but I'm seeing that in this world of mass democracy, social movements, communism, fascism, I can't just keep saying the same thing over and over again. I have to rethink it. So he's part of that from a very young age. The second piece that happens is he gets the Chicago interpretation of the Great Depression as a monetary crisis, mm. as one centered in a banking and financial system that then spreads out into a broader crisis. So then a couple of years later, when the ideas of John Maynard Keynes become over to the United States, and it seems like the explanation that we've been waiting for, Friedman already has a take, and he feels very solid in that take. And so Again, it's just a matter of years. The, the vast majority of um, Keynesian economists who shape the profession are just like three to four years older than him, but it puts them in a different place in their education when they encounter mm -hmm. Keynesianism. So I, I can see from the record that he's very skeptical of the general theory from the beginning, as are his professors. He thinks it's interesting. He thinks it's like very creative. He doesn't think it's the explanation of the Great Depression. Um, the sort of be all and end all. So, so that's very important. And, and, and that leads to an interesting point, actually, because, you know, for a while, William Friedman was in New York. He was in Washington, D.C. He was working for government agencies during the Second World War. Uh, and Milton Friedman, I think, himself has said, I can't believe how Keynesian I was at the time. But you kind of take that argument apart and you show, actually, he, he was no kind of Keynesian at all. Maybe he appeared to be because of wartime circumstances or, or whatever. Um, but actually, he had that Chicago core to his thinking, price theory, quantity theory of money all along. Is that is that a fair yeah, summation? Yeah, I think that is a fair summation. So um, there wasn't, you know, like a road to Damascus moment where suddenly he changed from being a New Deal liberal to something else. And what I really try to do is add context. I feel like that's really important to my mission. It's like, OK, there's so many reasons for Milton Friedman to vote Democratic. He, for my, his recollection, his first vote is cast for Roosevelt. One is the just backdrop of Hitler in Europe, right? And all that isolationism I just discussed. That's a compelling reason to say I'm voting for Roosevelt because I feel like he's most likely to do something about the situation in Europe. Um, and then he worked for the New Deal because there were no other jobs. He was very happy to take it. So what I really tried to do, though, was contextualize. Um, here's Friedman saying, let's um, raise taxes to stop inflation. Well, that does sound Keynesian, but what is the other option? Let's institute price controls throughout the economy. Well, he's choosing from a sort of menu. And then I also look just who are the Keynesian economists? Who are they hanging out with? What are their networks? And is Friedman part of them? Like, no, he's not. So he has these ideas on monetarism and uh, what we would call monetarism, they do shift over time, um, in part because of the architecture of how the Fed and the Treasury Department interact changes. But he's looking from the beginning at inflation as a monetary phenomenon. He's looking at the money and banking system as like this sort of baseline 
shaper of ac aggregate economic activity. And so that's distinctive and that stays with him. Mm, interesting. And, and there's something which is in the, the early Chicago plan and that Milton Friedman seems to carry with him through much of his career. And I, but I don't know whether he ever abandons the idea, but this is kind of 100% reserve banking. 100% money, 100% money, you yeah. know, I don't want to go down this rabbit <laughs> hole. So You've met enough libertarians to know how it goes. <laughs> But the, what yeah. was the deal there? So this is so interesting. And again, I can't normally geek out on 100% money, <laughs> but um, this was Henry Simon's idea that you basically should eliminate fractional reserve banking. Like you should just have the money you have and you can't you know, loan against it. And then you would create, that would be your, your regular banking system. And then you would have an investment banking system that would be parallel. So this goes to the influence of Henry Simons, who is a young professor. He's not even really a professor. He's kind of an advanced graduate student. And he has this... Um, very unique blend of sort of egalitarian, um, egalitarian free market synthesis. So there are some sectors that the government should run because they're natural monopolies up to and including railroads and utilities. And after that, you should just kind of let the market do its work. It's, it's really, I consider it an iteration on Henry George. It's like a Nuevo Henry Georgeism. Um, and so he's really important in Friedman's mental universe. And then he tragically dies in what appears to be a suicide right as Friedman gets back to Chicago. And so the sort of ghost of Henry Simons is with Milton Friedman for a long time. He's even talking about 100% money, I think, into the early 60s, and then eventually he just drops. But, but you can really see him thinking about it. And that just goes back to, in the beginning, Friedman is, is a willing to call for significant government intervention in the banking and financial system. Um, that's what his professors are calling for. It's what he's continuing to call for. And even to some extent, more um, democratic accountability for the Federal Reserve. I mean, he attacks the Fed from many directions, but one of them is the Federal Reserve has too much power. It's an unelected group of men with too much power. Mm. Um, so there is a little bit of that flavor of Simon's left in him throughout his career, but 100% money eventually falls by the wayside. Yeah. And so let's let's jump ahead a little bit to the first meeting of the Montpelier Society. Um, and... In a way, this part of the book just really crackles me. And I don't know if that's because I'm, yeah. I'm here at the IEA and, and we have that historic association. Yeah. But I found this, this part fascinating. Uh, and maybe it has some modern resonance as well. Um, but at the first Montpellier Society meeting, Hayek is kind of saying, we need to find a new approach to liberalism. It's not just the laissez-faire of the old days. Um, it has to be something new and exciting and, and inspiring almost. Yeah. Um, and it seems like Friedman really takes that to heart um, and all uh, you know he he is and remains an economist first and foremost but then he's sort of introducing these elements of almost political theory mm -hmm. as well um, and trying to refine a body of thought and that that sort of carries him on into the future into his sort of public intellectual phase into his political engagement and, and so on uh, is that is that sort of something you recognize? Yeah, I mean, I would say in the context of the Americans that come to Montpelier and Friedman is still trying to do that work of pushing against isolationism. So there's some of the American observers in the meeting who are part of that old right. And he's trying to say, no, we have a more global outlook. The other idea he's promoting in Montpelier and that he promotes throughout his career is what we would call a universal basic income what eventually was passed as a negative income tax. And so for him, this is the solution to the problem of liberalism. The idea is that you always have some level of poverty and inequality, and that therefore you create a basic income floor below which people can't fall. And he spends most of the meeting saying, this is a liberal policy. And a lot of the other members are like, we're not sure, how is it? And he says, well, it's counter cyclical. So more people will get the benefit. And this is before people are thinking of automatic stabilizers. So he's way ahead of his time in thinking about this. If it's hard times, more people, their income will fall, they'll naturally get this benefit. Um, and then uh, it won't interfere with the sort of overall setup of the society. So he's arguing this is a liberal policy um, because it's basically sort of bouncing people into the price system who otherwise wouldn't be there. Um, and so what's interesting is that's like a through line. He talks about that just consistently. He stops talking about it in the 1980s, which I think is because the earned income tax credit becomes a policy. So for me, that's another thing I'm trying to correct. Most people are encountering Milton Friedman in the 1980s and 1990s, and he's not talking about inequality. Towards the end of his life, he's talking about it again in the context of education, saying we need drastic reforms to education because that's the only thing that will forestall widening inequality. But for most of his career, it's a negative income tax is like, 
his policy. Yeah. And so um, that's just absolutely fascinating. And one of those things that might not come to mind when you think of Milton Friedman. Sure. And yet it wasn't only Ludwig von Mises who didn't like the idea. <laughs> like his wife Rose wrote a piece for the American Enterprise Institute, if effectively saying, yeah, uh, this is a little bit too socialistic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's interesting. She writes a whole essay on poverty and she doesn't mention <laughs> the NIT. So it's kind of an omission, a glaring omission. Um, mm. But yes, they, that was, they weren't always aligned. So that was probably a moment of misalignment. And I want to talk about her a little bit more, but I just want to dwell on this, the, you call it in the book, the second Chicago school. So mm -hmm. when Milton Friedman returns to Chicago yeah. as a professor, and this seems to be the most just extraordinary cluster of soon to be big name economists, all in the same place at the same time. That's not entirely an accident. Part of that is Milton Friedman um, being, as you say, an academic street fighter and, and bringing his friends and allies to Chicago. Um, but first of all, can you give us a sense of you know, what Chicago must have been like for, for an economist at that time? Must have been incredibly exciting. And then also, I, I, you know, for some reason I hadn't put two and two together, but Hayek was there mm -hmm. for about a decade, yeah. same time as Friedman. He was working on the Constitution of Liberty. And yet there doesn't seem to be all that much interplay between them. Um, maybe no surviving correspondence, maybe they only talked in person. Yeah. I don't, it seems weird to me that the two big figures in free market economics, the sort of heroes of the IEA, um, are at the same university in the same city for a decade. And it doesn't seem to be an obvious partnership emerging. Yeah, well, well I, in one sense, the fact that everyone is there is due in part to Hayek. So Hayek is instrumental in, he's a, in the wake of A Road to Serfdom, he's approached by some um, businessmen who want to fund him and his ideas, and he eventually locates that project at the University of Chicago. Uh, separately, Friedman's hired, but that um, Hayek-inspired project hires his brother-in-law, Aaron Director, and then eventually that will provide a seed ground for George Stigler coming um, mm. through another another fund of money supports George Stigler, but it creates that climate. So it's frustrating. That would be a, probably a project unto its own because right when Friedman and Hayek are probably having the most influence on each other, you can't get in there right. because they're in the same neighborhood and they're going to each other's houses. I know they have dinners, you know, they call it Fritz and, you know, Milton. There's a bit there. They have, they're two strongly um, opinionated men who come to different conclusions, especially on economics. So I think they're close, but they're agreeing to disagree. And Friedman, in fact, does not want Hayek to be on the economics faculty. Mm. He doesn't think of him as an economist because he's not doing empirical, theoretically informed work. And so Hayek ends up elsewhere in the university. I think there's a, quite a rich exchange between them. And I think to the extent that Friedman continues to kind of broaden and talk about you know, write things like capitalism and freedom and think about the competitive framework. He doesn't use a competitive order, but he'll talk about the conditions of competition. I feel like a lot of this is Hayekian language. Mm. It's just that Hayek is not on board with his monetary policy. And there's a few, um, there's a few records of their debates. And so, uh, you know, Friedman will say, he'd be talking about, it, it's before the monetary growth rule, but it's similar, the similar concept. He's talking about that. And then Hayek just thinks that's just going to be accelerating inflation forever and ever. So they really, they disagree in some really profound areas, but it seems like they also know that they need to combine forces in a way, because there mm. are so few people that share to the extent they do share their commonalities. All right. Uh, let me jump ahead a little bit, because we're dwelling on the early days to a certain extent. Um, and I'm missing some good stuff, but you can read the book and, and find it out for yourselves. Uh, so let's jump forward to when the monetary history of the United States comes out. Um, probably one of the great books in economics. Uh, it, it, at this point, I mean, Milton Friedman's reputation as an academic econ economist is already pretty well established. So his work on permanent income hypothesis, for example, mm -hmm. that, that's really put him in the limelight academically more so than his work on monetary policy. Um, capitalism, capitalism and free, freedom has come out, but it hasn't been a big hit, sort of hard to get copies, vanish without yeah. a trace. But the monetary history has a huge impact. Um, tell us a little bit about that project and in particular the role that Anna Schwartz played in it as well. Yeah, so this project was helpful to me in my dark days and, I, and it took them 12 years to write a monetary history. Like I eventually <laughs> I will finish this book. Um, so 
Um, Anna Schwartz was partnered with Milton Friedman by Arthur Burns, his uh, long ago college instructor. And they were at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And really, um, Milton did it as a favor to Arthur Burns. And he joined this project with Anna Schwartz and he was interested in money. So their task was to develop a monetary history of the United States. And Anna Schwartz did most of the work. She did the statistical, finding the statistical data, um, you know, running the numbers. Then she also did a lot of the historical work. Um, and Friedman had this kind of theoretical take on what he thought, how money functioned in the economy. So when you combine these two minds, you get something much bigger than either would have done separately. And I think it's the heft of the book, the hundred some odd years covered, and the narrative that Schwartz really put together that's a new narrative of the Great Depression that puts the Federal Reserve in the center of the action. And, you know, people were like, yeah, we know Milton Friedman money, blah, blah, blah. And then they got the book and they were really like, this is different. You know, mm -hmm. it just, it was so, um, it was so big. The other thing is they had command of the data in a way that was just truly exceptional. So um, the Federal Reserve today has so much data and we can access it so easily. And all of a sudden, Friedman and Schwartz are appearing with their own monumental historical database of what the Fed has done. And you can actually see the Fed start responding. They start publishing monetary aggregates. They start providing more data because they're like, oh, my gosh, if we don't do this, these, these other two folks are going to show up and say, we know all. They have, not, they have no response because they don't know as much. So that really kind of cracks open Friedman's role as a public intellectual. And mm. in part, it's because the book is so monumental. In part, it's because until the book is done, that's like what he's laboring to do. He really needs to get that done. Once it's done, there's like sort of a degree of freedom that he finds. And after that is when he really becomes both a driver of the field of economics and also more in the public spotlight. And I think it you know, fundamentally changed our understanding of the Great Depression and what had happened there uh, and profoundly affected monetary policy going forward. So as you say, I mean, a monumental achievement. But oddly, despite it being this incredible work of scholarship, maybe its most immediate effect that, that you talk about in the book is it brings him into the orbit of Barry Goldwater and Republican politics. And suddenly, Milton Friedman is dragged into the kind of partisan presidential race, yeah. and he doesn't really seem to resist. No, I would say he dives into it, in fact. Okay. So he's been kind of courting Goldwater, and it sort of goes nowhere, and then as Goldwater is launching a presidential campaign, he begins courting Friedman because now he wants to have, um, you know, economic advisors. And so pretty quickly, um, the two are working together insofar as Goldwater's campaign really has an organized uh, policy wing. But what really happens is that um, it's a bit of a disorganized campaign. Um, Goldwater's, you know, very media mediagenic and says interesting things, but isn't always available to comment. And it's not always clear what his plan is. And so basically reporters discover Milton Friedman is always ready to talk, sounds really coherent, and gives you some idea into what Goldwater might do. So all of this press starts accumulating to Friedman in part because Goldwater's campaign is very suspicious of the media. And so that has the effect of elevating Friedman. And once reporters figure out how great he is to talk to, like they're not gonna forget that. Yeah. And it didn't really work out with Goldwater. It, and this wouldn't be Milton Friedman's last political disappointment, I guess. Um, in a way, it must have been a traumatic experience. Nixon is in the White House. Arthur Burns, who is a great friend, mentor of Milton Friedman, becomes chair of the Federal Reserve, but pursues decidedly unfriedmanite policies. Yeah. Yeah. So do you want me to talk yeah, a little yeah, bit please. about that? Okay. So we're fast forwarding from Goldwater. There's kind of a moment after Goldwater where Friedman is now a known quantity. He's in the media a lot. Um, and he's more suspicious of Richard Nixon, but Richard Nixon has some really long-term friends of his in working for him, um, including Arthur Burns, including George Shultz. And so I go into this in some detail in the book, and it really is, if you thought economics was boring, this is like the romance of economics. Should I say the bromance of economics? Because essentially Arthur Burns starts running a monetary policy that Friedman thinks is completely wrong. And there's a moment when Burns comes out in favor of incomes policy, which is essentially the beginning of wage and price controls. And Friedman, you know, literally gets up at night and writes him this like six page letter. You know, Arthur, how could you? I feel betrayed. You know, it's a very impassioned letter. And then 
apparently they have a pretty difficult phone conversation. And then Freeman sends another, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it. But then he's like, then he has to send another letter because he's like, so I was just at a convention of bankers and they asked me, what do I think about the Fed? And he suddenly realizes I'm the Fed's number one, like public enemy number one of the Fed. I'm doing this for you know over 10 years. I can't stop now yeah. that my lifelong friend is running it. I'm going to have to become his critic. And he basically decides that's what he's going to do. He can't, he has to stick with his intellectual integrity and turn sort of sacrifice that friendship. And so it's never quite the same and it's very difficult. And I think it's just a tremendous, it's a tremendous irony and it's also a tremendous loss. I think Arthur Burns was a very proud man and in some ways went out of his way to not listen to Friedman because for so long Friedman, he thought of Friedman as a student mm -hmm. and he just would not listen to him. And we would have had, a, I think, a very different experience of the 70s if he had taken some of the advice Friedman was now tendering in letter after letter after letter. And basically Burns just stopped reading and stopped listening. Um, and so then, you know, Friedman would talk to Schultz or he would talk to Nixon. So yeah, it was a yeah. bumpy time. And I know we've we, we got to get to audience questions soon. I know there's going to be a lot of a lot of interest, a lot of questions, um, but a couple more things. So uh, third time lucky in a way in terms of politics, you get to the, the 1980s, the era of Thatcher, uh, the era of Reagan. Um, and Milton Friedman is kind of at the height of his powers. He, he has this, I mean, he's had the Newsweek column for a while, the platform of the PBS, PBS TV series, which people often still tell me, people of a certain vintage, admittedly, but yeah. people still talk about and say, you know, that's where it all started there. for me. Still out there on YouTube. The still. PBS series, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what what changed? Why did, why did it work that time around? Why did Milton Friedman's ideas really start to cut through? Well, I mean, he, he would be the first to say, it's, I'm not that persuasive. It's a change in uh, the, the basic political economy. We see this sort of um, social democracy of the post-war years running aground on deficit spending and high inflation. And also there's the war in Vietnam. And so the sort of political syntheses and policies that had been crafted, they're all undermined by inflation. And I talk about this in some degree in the last chapters of the book, the way Inflation, so essentially the post-war economic world, and this is similar to in Britain, is created for a stable price, a world of stable prices. Mm. So much so that there is no um, plan B for when prices become unstable. And so all the regulations depend on a stable price level. So you have an interest rate cap. Well, when interest rates start going up because it's trying to get ahead of inflation, it totally changes the profitability structure of the banking system and then they lobby for deregulation and then housing prices are going up. So you have a homeowner politics. So all these different things are happening and Friedman has this coherent explanation for it. Um, you know, he doesn't like inflation. I mean, he has a theory for how to cure it and he has a theory for how to prevent it getting started. And he really feels simpatico with Reagan who comes at a moment, both politically, he's bringing kind of fresh energy, the morning in America idea, and then a very coherent set of different economic ideas. Um, instead of spending money, we're going to try to unleash the private sector. Um, and so that, I think, is Friedman finds this tremendously rewarding. There's a couple of cross currents in the Reagan years that I'll just highlight. One is that despite Paul Volcker's success in taming inflation and despite the fact that you really could see Volcker as in Friedman's lineage in some ways, Friedman very much dislikes Volcker. I mean, he hates him and he's... He very, very begrudges anything that Paul Volcker did right. Mm. And he tends to say, well, it was really Reagan who did right by supporting Paul Volcker. So there's that. <laughs> um, and then it also creates um, it, the, the, the monetary aggregates and their relationship to inflation. They also break down mm -hmm. um, in the 1980s. And so that's a period of like intellectual questioning for Friedman. Eventually, he will come to believe that that was a temporary and that kind of long durée, the aggregates and monetary policy do hold that relationship. Um, and then the other piece of the puzzle is Freeman begins as someone who's not opposed to deficit spending, who's not a balanced budget you know, fundamentalist, but he becomes more and more comfortable as does the Republican Party in general with deficit spending. And he's willing to kind of set aside his misgivings because he's so deal so in tune with Reagan on other things. So that's kind of the beginning of the, what some people call the two Santa Clauses theory of American politics. Well, one, <laughs> you know, one um, 
cuts taxes and one spends. And that's kind of the model we're, we're still in today. All right. Now, as it's time to go to audience questions, I think I might abuse my privilege of as chair and save one of my own for the end that we didn't have time to get to. But let me first get a sense of how many questions do we have, burning questions in the room. Okay, we've got a, got a few. We may, need to, we may need to group these. But let's start with Linda at the back, please. Thanks. I'm going to take my privilege as chair. And thank you, Jennifer uh, Burns, for coming to us tonight. Thank you for your excellent book. I really enjoyed it. Recommend it to everyone. I assume that you have no relation to Arthur Burns. No relation. Um, <laughs> for for anybody who hasn't read it yet, there is a shout out to the IEA. Um, Tom's predecessor, uh, Ralph Harris, hosted Milton Friedman at a dinner party, and that's where he first met Margaret Thatcher, and he obviously had a great influence on her as well. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit both about the chapter that you have on hidden figures and the impact that women had on Friedman's work. And also, I appreciated that your biography was not at all a hagiography, but that you really pointed to his blind sides. I mean, the work of Kahneman wasn't out there yet, but the mm -hmm. fact that you know maybe there was a bit of reverse engineering, he had a theory and then he went to find the facts to confirm his theory. Um, and that is not from the hostility because, of course, at the IA we're all Hayekians because uh, our founder was, was told by Hayek, go found a think tank. And it was Milton Friedman who, after the Thatcher Revolution, said, you can close your doors, you've succeeded. <laughs> um, so, so thank you. That is a theme of the book that is not one I was looking for, which is the role of women in Friedman's life and work. And so all of his major work from capitalism and freedom to uh, per, uh, uh, theory of the consumption function to monetary history of the United States, these are all co-authored with women either formally or in the theory of a consumption function informally. And so um, the introduction uh, attributes to the, um, it talks about how these ideas came out of conversations with a group of women. So in the book, I try to dig into that. And there's kind of two aspects of that I think are important. One is, it's like, no wonder he was so successful, right? Behind every great man is, in his case, several great women. So um, I think that explains like, his intellectual range because these women brought something, uh, whether it was historical research or empirical data analysis, they brought something to him that he himself did not have. And secondly, it's just unusual that he had this many collaborators who were women. And I think he had an ability to kind of see what they could contribute intellectually and then draw them into a collaborative relationship. And one, I go into some detail with Anna Schwartz, who at the time was working hand in hand with Friedman, was being told by um, the staff of the National Bureau of Economic Research, many of whom were also Columbia faculty, that she had not qualified for a PhD degree in economics. And it was literally until a monetary history was in galleys and they said, no, this does not qualify as a PhD dissertation that Friedman got so mad because they were basically saying your magnum opus is not sufficient to qualify for a PhD degree in Columbia, that he really got in there and fought for her and she got that doctorate. So I try to puzzle out like why, why was he so distinct among his peers? So I don't know if there's a firm answer to it. To the blind spots, yeah, we didn't touch upon this, but in the Goldwater campaign, Friedman took it upon himself to be a very a a strong advocate of Goldwater's opposition to civil rights. And he simply believed he incorporated the analysis of a student, Gary Becker, that racial discrimination will be solved by the market and we didn't need an intrusive government. Um, and so to my mind, that was too much theory and not enough recognition of the kind of social realities um, on the ground. And so especially for a champion of freedom to look at this incredible system of state-sponsored terrorism and oppression and to say there was no need to intervene. I found that very disappointing, And it, but I wrote a book about a human being, not about a god. So um, yes, let's keep him human and, and remember those blind spots. Yeah. Uh, Tim, I saw you had a question. Yeah. Um, do you think that well, do, do you think that uh, Love the Freedom was a, a success or a failure? Hmm. I'm thinking particularly about um, the monetary economics, which of course is a very large part of his work. And we've just had, around the world, a burst of inflation, which in my view was very clearly caused by excessive growth for the quantity of money engineered by governments and central banks, 
Um, and so the fact that this happened in some sense was um, not, in a sense, Friedman failed. That, that, but even worse, the great bulk of the economic profession failed to foresee what was going to happen and subsequently has not analyzed it in monetary terms essentially at all. Thank you. Um, so, so let me take one step back and then I'll get to the more specific 2021 question. Um, I do think if you look at the practice of central banking from the Volcker shock on, you do see the imprint of Friedman and it's almost the Hayekian imprint of rules over discretion as just becoming broadly accepted. And so he always talked about a monetary growth rule and in, that's really evolved to sort of um, either interest rate targeting or inflation targeting. But that basic concept of um, let's have a stable growth path and let's make sure that monetary policy should really fade into the background. We shouldn't be thinking about it at all. Now, in terms of 2021, I do think that Friedman would have supported relief spending. I mean, it is a helicopter drop. What happened? The infusion of like a fiscal expansion of the money supply. And I think based on how he responded to the Great Depression, if he were alive during coronavirus, he would say, yes, let's do something like that. Now, in the United States, we had four rounds of relief funding. I think he might have said, let's stop it, too. Um, and I think one problem was that his he, he, he had been pushed so far to the side analytically that nobody thought three or four would be a problem. And you had the whole team transitory and the denial. Um, I tend to hang out with the economists around Stanford who do analyze this robustly in monetary terms and who did say this is a problem. Uh, even before the outbreak of inflation, who were calling attention, the Fed made a shift that seems very subtle, but that they would target average inflation rather than 2% inflation, which kind of baked in the chance of an up and a down. And so, and, and then they deprioritized stable prices over um, low unemployment. Subtle shifts, but but cutting against the grain of Friedman. So I don't know that these things are ever won or lost. I think they come and go. Um, I think there's a lot more consciousness of inflation. I also think it's really hard right now to get a straight story about inflation in the United States because of the very high stakes of the current election. And so I think there's a real um, reluctance to dig in and say, were there policy mistakes that caused this? Um, when a more comfortable scenario for many people is we were faced with a crisis of unprecedented global dimensions and the policy response did the best that it could, which I think is actually a fair interpretation. I think they could have stopped a little earlier if they had a little more Friedman in the bloodstream. But at the same time, it really was a, a sort of muddle through. Um, I think people will be more interested in Friedman because we're living through inflation and, you know, his ideas are not the solution um, stop, but they're where the thinking starts on the modern understanding of inflation. So I think people will be going back to Friedman in that way. Okay. Uh, let's see. Cool. Yeah, the gentleman there, please. Yeah, you, you mentioned that before, you, you mentioned that before your book, there's no book on Friedman. Well, what about with the two lucky people? Yeah. Oh, thank you. That, so that is, um, Melton and Rose wrote this long memoir, um, Two Lucky People. And I have to say, this was almost like, for me, like public enemy number one, because it's a lovely book. It's very kind and it's not very accurate um, in many ways. So some of it chronologically, I would have to kind of reshape the chronology. Um, and some of it is just, um, you know, not remembering the history right. So Friedman calls himself a Keynesian because he just looks at this document and says, oh, I called for higher taxation. It must have been a Keynesian. And then the other thing I figured out was that, you know, they write this at the end of their life. They want to be very generous to everybody. Um, so they talk about the head of the Coles Commission at Chicago. You can tell they don't like him, but it's pretty it's spirited conversation. And it's like, no, this was a vicious fight. And like, Friedman stole his Rockefeller grant and like he went to Yale. Like it was bad. And apparently along the way, had the, had Friedman's opponent had like a mini nervous breakdown, right? So you don't get this from two lucky people, which is fine because they're not trying to settle scores, but it's a very, it's a, it's a positive take. Um, and so, yes, you can read them alongside each other, but there's a lot that I'm going to cover that two lucky people is not going to cover and vice versa. There was one on this side. 
How did um, Milton Friedman influence his son, David Friedman? And if at all, how did David Friedman influence Milton Friedman? Yeah, that's a great question. So David Friedman was very active in the student libertarian movement in the 1960s. And so my understanding is he, he considered himself an anarcho-capitalist. I think he still might. He went much further and was willing to be more of a purist than his father. He did get his father on the phone with different libertarian groups, and I think he essentially helped draw his father into advocacy for ending the draft. Um, probably that would have happened anyway, but in some ways, David was a conduit. Um, and so Milton and Rose really discouraged David from studying economics. He eventually ended up following in his uncle's footsteps in teaching law and economics at Santa Clara. So I've met him a handful of times. Hi, David, if you're listening to this. Um, <laughs> and so I think he would say that he goes a little bit further than his father, and he's just more comfortable with that. And his father was maybe more strategic and more focused on what he could accomplish you know, in his, in his lifetime. But, I mean, ending the draft, Milton Friedman regarded as one of his great achievements, right? Yes. And so this is another, you know, I talk about this in some detail. This is another place where Friedman was able, just by his sort of presence, to say, it's okay, you can talk about ending the draft. I'm like a Republican college professor. I think it's okay to end the draft. So it really made it seem less threatening. And it's really astonishing that it's Richard Nixon who ends the draft. Um, but I think that was part of Friedman was able to just um, bring a very rational lens to discussing this problem and to make it seem less like a capitulation to the anti-war protesters and more like this is what a modern nation can do, you know, when facing many different economic and fiscal burdens. And then he would also argue this is more compatible with freedom. And so really kind of pushing that argument through. Incidentally, Ayn Rand's group was also, you know, it was like the libertarian cause to let, maybe that's the high point of organized libertarianism, um, you know, in the 20th century at least, so. Interesting, yeah. Uh, what else? Matthew at the front. I think his book, uh, Capitalism and Freedom, has stood the test of time well. Uh, do you think uh, Capitalism and Freedom has stood the test of time well? I mean, his, his argument that uh, economic freedom is a prerequisite of political freedom. Um, as if you look over the last few decades, we've had some very successful countries that have some form of capitalism and not much freedom. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it looked really good maybe in the 1990s. Um, and I think that equation was never as easy as Friedman wanted it to be. And if he a little bit knew he was making it seem easier than it was. Um, he, at the end of his life, was very optimistic, though, that that synthesis would hold in part because of the example of Chile, which for a while had a dictatorship, but had a capitalist economy. And he predicted this, these two things are incompatible. Eventually, political freedom will come to Chile. And then he looked at China in his lifetime and said, this will also happen with China. There'll be more Tiananmen's. Eventually, the system will fall, right? The, the Soviet Union had fallen. So um, it's interesting, though, I found in like the last years of his life, he gave a couple of interesting interviews on this where he said, first of all, with relation to the ending of the Cold War, he was too hasty in saying privatize, privatize, privatize. He said, and this is your Hayekian note, I now realize the rule of law is fundamental and institutions are fundamental and you can't just tear things down and expect you know new things to grow up without a structure. And then um, he also started talking about, you know, he used to have political freedom and economic freedom. He started talking about civil, civil freedom. And in this, I think he was reacting to some of the um, more capitalist Asian economies that were not politically free. And so he said, well, civic freedom means you can kind of assemble and you have freedom of speech. So we don't have the Stasi, you know, the secret police, but you still don't have a choice at the ballot box. So he did start to nuance it. And I think I think that's really a relic of the Cold War, that simple tautology when you had half, you know, half the world divided into U.S. and Soviet spheres, and then that made more sense. So I don't know if he'd be able to put it together quite so neatly today. It's a great question. Thank you. All right. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I guess about half of the, um, the states in the United States are now have some forms of uh, school voucher. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, what would be uh, Friedman's greatest legacy the monetary theory or the school voucher? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, it kind of connects to this last question of how well has capitalism and freedom stood up. If I listed all the policies that were proposed, like so many of them have come to pass or have become 
um, become really important. School vouchers is one of them. Um, I mean, I think that that is still a policy that's unfolding. I think getting more competition into the public system is happening. I don't know it's always happening by virtue of vouchers. Um, I think it's very unsettled where I think we've had better luck. We've had much better luck preventing a second Great Depression. And I think we'll have recessions. I don't know that we'll ever see a global depression on that scale, at least one, because we have so much more knowledge of money and banking. So I think that's been more successful overall. Um, I don't, I think it's going to take a lot before education. I don't think education will ever be fully privatized in the United States, um, which was, I think his ultimate end goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else from the floor? Oh, okay. One more there. Could you briefly explain Friedman's and Hayek's explanations for the great depression and who do you think was right? <laughs> Sorry. Right? That's a good one with four minutes to go. <laughs> uh, Friedman and Hayek's explanations for the Great Depression. Um, so I would say that I think that Friedman's reaction, I would say a lot of Friedman's effort, I'll take it in this way, a lot of Friedman's effort to craft a new liberalism, we sometimes think of that as like, oh, this was Hayek's call for a new liberalism. But I think, in fact, it was reacting against Hayek's first reaction to the Great Depression, which as a business cycle that had to be led to run its course. Um, and so I think Freeman felt that's not tenable in the modern era. And so we have to have another set of responses for economic crisis. Um, and so you know, I think looking at the, I think the, the Federal Reserve played a really important role or non-role in the depth of the contraction in the United States. And to the extent that I think Friedman really dug into that, I think that's important because we think of it as a monetary interpretation, but it's also an institutional interpretation and a political interpretation. And those are huge parts of the puzzle as to how monetary policy actually unfolds in the real world. And so I think that sort of fine-grained analysis, it both talks about the specificity of the 1930s and gives us some understanding in the like broad sweep of history of what's going on in episodes of inflation, hyperinflation, or deflation. Thank you. Well, Jennifer, thank you. And I'm, I'm very relieved we're going to finish on time because I know you just arrived in the UK from the West Coast this morning. You must be exhausted. Um, I said I'd abuse my privilege and I'll, let, me, let me do it doubly so with a couple of closing uh, observations disguised as questions, <laughs> and I'd love, I'd love to hear your, your response. So I think, first of all, there, there's a theme, certainly in the introduction to the book and in the epilogue, um, about, and, and it's implicit in this idea of Milton Friedman as the last conservative, that we are undergoing a kind of political realignment, um, and that politics is reorganizing itself around issues of culture and national identity, or group identity, rather than around economics. And I wonder, on the one hand, what role Milton Friedman and his ideas have in that new political order, but on the other, whether that realignment really means we just need another new liberalism. And, and in fact, we desperately need another new Milton Friedman who can take the old ideas um, and update them and make them relevant for the model, modern time and explain how they deal with our problems today. So that's my first um, disguised observation. And the second thing, I just wanted to mention, I'm curious for your thought on. Um, a few years ago, when I first came back to the UK um, from the United States, I was speaking at an IEA organized student conference. I was on a, a sort of just a panel, I can ask us anything type of thing. Um, and someone said in 15 years of think tanking, <laughs> uh, what have you learned? <laughs> um, and obviously I've learned all sorts of things. That's one of the great things about working in a think tank. Uh, but what I came up with, and, and what I think is actually very true, is that when you're a classical liberal or a libertarian and you get into these ideas, now many people, you know, there's the old cliche, it started with Ayn Rand, and you would have encountered a lot of that with your first book. Uh, but for me, and certainly a lot of the people I know in this movement, started with Milton Friedman, uh, with capitalism and freedom or with free to choose. Um, I mean, I can very well remember reading free to choose for the first time and thinking, like, you know, this guy has the answers, this is fascinating, and this is the kind of thing I want to spend my career working on. But then you, you learn about sort of more radical theories, your anarcho-capitalisms or whatever else, um, and maybe you get more radical and you start to think, oh, maybe Milton Friedman wasn't, wasn't everything, you know, went to a certain point, but we should go further. Um, and you go through all sorts of different 
kind of intellectual pathways. And the thing I said that I'd, I'd ultimately learned from 15 years of think tanking was Milton Friedman was right about everything, <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> you end up right back where you started. Um, and I, you know, I do think that that is basically true, but we've also already touched on a couple of things that you think he didn't get right. I'm interested to know what you think his biggest mistake was. So the two questions there in a way are, um, is Milton Friedman still relevant in a political realignment? And do we desperately need another version of him? Uh, and secondly, what did he really get wrong? So um, let me start with the first one. You know, I'll say a couple of things. Friedman is often criticized from the left for depoliticizing um, issues and kind of making them just into economic issues. And I don't actually think that's a terrible thing to do. Um, I worry that the politics you have around identity and culture and nation can go to darker places more quickly than the more policy-oriented economic conversation where you're staying on a terrain that at least has empirical grounding. Mm. And so I don't know. I do. There is a realignment of sorts happening in the United States. Um, it's really being driven by the transformation of one party. And so should that transformation cycle come to an end. They don't know exactly where it will be. But I think if you look globally, I mean, it's it's very interesting to see, like in Argentina, we have Friedman part two in response mm -hmm. to extended inflation. We don't know how people will settle out with the, the inflationary bound that we've just had. Um, so I do think there is, I think it's very fashionable to say like neoliberalism is over. We're ending the neoliberal era. I don't think it's going to happen that fast. Um, and I think there's going to be lots of things that continue and that should continue from the so-called neoliberal era. Um, what did Friedman get wrong? I've become more and more convinced that he could have used a, a bigger dose of Frank Knight and Henry Simons going back to the 1930s in that both of them had almost a gut instinct about um, the stability of their society, especially in the face of inequality and not just absolute returns but social differentials and that being very destabilizing. And I think Friedman, part of it is that he lived in the era of the Great Compression when incomes were reduced and at a moment when capitalism was generating less inequality over time, which, which it does in general as countries emerge from you know, um, less developed to more developed states. You know, there's a bigger middle class and the statistics of inequality go down. But I think if you look, for example, what's happened in Chile in the past five to 10 years, it's not just about the statistics, it's about the feeling of living in the society and the feeling of having opportunity and the feeling of having a fair shake. And so I think sometimes Friedman was too analytical, too 30,000 feet up, to the statistics show everybody's better off and the statistics show incomes are converging and a little less gut instinct for how do people feel about their place in society and whether it's a fair society, a just society and one that they wanna fight for and maintain. And so I think Maybe I'm asking him to be in the end a little less analytic, but his power was to be that incredible brain in a jar, that analytic machine. So, um, so maybe there would be something lost in that as well. All right. Well, Jennifer, thank you very much.